Good day, everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to Australia Institute TV. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal country and pay my respects to the traditional owners past and present. Uh, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and sovereignty was obviously never ceded. We do like to do these webinars at least once a week, but days and times do vary like tonight when we're coming to you a little bit later than usual with an international guest at five o'clock. So thanks for joining us. But to make sure that you're registered for all our webinars, uh, you can head on over to our website at australiainstitute.org.au. And just a few tips before we begin to help make sure that things run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A box where you can ask questions of our panelists and you should also be able to upvote questions from other people and make comments. Uh, just a reminder to keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll have to boot you out. And finally, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will be posted up on our YouTube channel afterwards and uh, emailed around to everyone who's RSVP today. So in November this year, representatives from nearly every country on earth will, fingers crossed, converge for what is being described as the most significant climate event since the 2015 Paris Agreement. The outcome of this United Nations summit known as COP26 and hosted by the United Kingdom this year, will help shape the fates of billions of people for decades to come. Recently, the United Kingdom uh, Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, declared that, quote, the world must go beyond hot air at the COP26 if we're to have any chance of keeping our planet cool. For that to happen over the next six months, the world must be relentless in our ambition and determination, laying the foundations on which success will be built. And I guess for most of us, when we think about global climate action, we usually limit our thoughts to the role of government. Uh, the Australian government's not real crash hot on climate action, but for most people, that's what we think of. However, all over the world, companies, cities, investors, and other organizations are working to achieve net zero emissions. In fact, earlier this year at the Biden Leaders Summit, Prime Minister Scott Morrison described Australia's journey to net zero as being led by pioneering local corporations. But is this true? And what does this actually look like in practical terms? In the jungle of glossy ads and marketing claims, it can often be quite hard to distinguish the greenwash from the real action. So today I'm delighted to be joined by three guests who are going to shed some light on the action being taken outside of government, because God knows there's not a lot of action happening inside the Australian government, at the federal one at least, uh, and how crucial that will be for bold climate claims, uh, that bold climate claims are matched by bold and credible and legitimate action. So please let me introduce you to Nigel Topping, a United Nations high-level champion for climate action for COP26, with a mandate to accelerate climate action by all non-state actors the world over. The Race to Zero campaign aims to build the largest alliance of businesses, investors, cities, states, regions, universities, all of whom have committed to halve emissions by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050 or sooner. Prior to this role, Nigel was the CEO of We Mean Business, where he drove radical collaboration for climate action, working with the world's most influential businesses. And he was also the executive director of the Carbon Disclosure Project. I'm also joined by Ben Burge, the executive director of Telstra Energy, He's part of Australia's largest telecommunications provider. Ben is a longtime champion for climate action and energy transition in Australia. And prior to leading Telstra's clean energy transition, he was the CEO of Australasia's, Australasia's largest 100% renewable energy generator, Meridian Energy, which is better known perhaps by its electricity brand, PowerShop. As an organization, Telstra is not only an official participant in the UN Race to Zero with a commitment to reducing its absolute emissions by 50% by 2030, but has already achieved carbon neutrality for its operations and network. In 2020, Telstra committed to enabling renewable energy generation equivalent to 100% of its consumption by 2025. And last but not least, I'm joined by Richie Merzian, our Climate and Energy Program Director. He was the former Australian government negotiator to the UN Climate Convention and has a long track record working on the domestic and international climate agendas. A big welcome to everyone, Nigel, Ben and Richie. Thanks for joining us. 
Nigel, I might come to you first to kick things off. Um, for people who are unfamiliar, can you explain the race to zero and the global momentum that it's building? Yes, um, the, the race to zero is something which um, Gonzalo Munoz, who's the Chilean high-level champion for COP25, and I launched actually just, just under a year ago to try and put a wrap around all the efforts to get all those different non-state actors that you mentioned, universities, um, schools, but particularly cities, um, states and regions like non-national governments um, and businesses and investors. So particularly those economic actors in the private sector and local government who have real power and to get them all to say to the world, we're committed to getting to zero by 2050 and we're putting in place concrete short-term plans and they're going to publish progress against them so that we're held accountable. So it's, it's trying to build a big wave of momentum to signal to national governments that the rest of society is getting on with this transition and that might be a good idea to catch up with them. Ben, Telstra is obviously one of the best known brands in Australia and one of the biggest service providers. Can you explain why Telstra joined the race to zero and, and what that looks like for your company? Yeah, we, um, we're, we're, a, we're a business that is physically, very physical, um, geographically expansive and energy intensive. Um, uh, we have a relationship with most households and businesses in Australia. And so, um, you know, with that kind of privilege comes a lot of responsibility. And so we see, you know, really our role is, is not just to take care of our own mess, um, but try and apply the technologies and methods that we use internally um, to have an impact on decarbonising the, the whole economy. And so for us, um, joining Race to Zero and um, becoming carbon neutral last year, one of the important things for us was actually establishing a market linked price of carbon. So in the absence of a government set price on carbon, we've now got a market linked price on carbon that you know, um, materialises a real marginal abatement curve inside our business. And um, that is both terrifying and, and exciting when you look at the shape of the forward curve. Um, for carbon in in well in Australia um, globally, but um, you know, I think just a couple of nights ago, Nigel, um, you know, carbon in Europe hit 80 bucks US, right? So um, that that was kind of you know we see this is now a market function for us, um, and it's inexorably linked to you know, efficiency and underlying energy costs. So um, we see it much more than just a compliance tick. Um the next question I had, Nigel, was for you. And I guess I wanted to reflect on the fact that the UK is really the birthplace of coal-fired power, yet you've largely been successful at weeding out coal from the UK's electricity system. Australia is still very much on that journey and quite resistant to it. What lessons do you think Australia could learn from the UK there? Um, I, mean, I mean, one, to have... Um to back your um, your own natural resources. I mean, UK doesn't have sun so much like Australia, but we've got a lot of wind, it's an island country. Um, you know, so, so huge um, wind power already being generated and still going exponentially. So back your own natural resources, it's a matter of energy security, right? It's not, about, not, not a bad thing. To, to back, back business and engineers to solve problems, I think, um, and there's a couple of things that I think you guys really got right and, and, and one which um, is, is to look out for. Put end dates. You know, the UK a long time ago said we'll burn our last coal in 2025. We're down to about 2% now. And I brought that forward. And then create the kind of market signals which help um, uh, with investment decisions. So the UK, you know, in the years, it bends right, the European price on carbon is high now. But for a long time, it was languishing close to zero. And so the UK put in a floor price of £18 pounds um and that, that and what that meant was basically there was no investment case for coal um whatsoever um i think the other thing to to take care of which is is, is the, this idea of the just transition we know this is an inevitable transition if it's not managed with long-term policy signals like we're gonna wind this down over 10 years say then the human damage in terms of lost jobs and dislocated communities will be high so it really this is a predictable industrial revolution so there's time to do it in a managed way um and that, that that that's something which you know the when the uk closed most of its coal mines that wasn't done as part of this 
long transition. So I think there's, there's some positive lessons and some negative lessons to learn from um, what, what's happened in the UK on the, 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 the end of coal. Yeah, Ben, I'll come to you in a second on, uh, I want to ask you about renewable energy, but Richie, there's um, currently a by-election happening in the Upper Hunter, one of the major centres for coal mining in Australia. And, you know, we hear a lot that people, uh, you know, are opposed to anything that's kind of a threat, but we've heard quite a different thing from people on the ground there. Um, what do we know about how people in coal communities think about that transition and the other impacts of coal? Mm. Yeah, some of the some of the views that have been coming forward, uh, not just the most vocal that tend to make the news, but um, there's a strong community sentiment that there is an eventual there is an eventual turn in demand for coal, for thermal coal in particular, which is really where most of the coal in the Upper Hunter um, is. And given that Australia's major markets for coal, being Japan, South Korea, and China, have all taken on carbon neutrality or net zero pathways, you're looking at a diminishing demand going forward. And so really, when you look at what's going on in New South Wales and in the Upper Hunter, there's numerous new coal mine proposals. But how does that balance out with a future that looks continually shaky and will only likely go down? Those, those mining proposals will cannibalize the existing industries. And I think a, a number of workers in a number of communities uh, want to see actual plans for how they're taken care of, not just to the next election, but beyond, especially since climate action uh, means that overseas demand will diminish and that local plans need to change. So we are seeing this come through. Uh, what we're not seeing, though, is anyone taking this um, that next stage, which is actually putting in place plans like the UK has or like Germany has. Not, not just in terms of when the last coal-fired power station or coal mine um, will operate, but just even sort of what the demand looks like, what the communities could be doing, um, where those investments should go. So that there's a real gap in the market, uh, which is not meeting what community expectations are, that, that things are changing and that government has a role to play in smoothing that out. Yeah, and I think we've done some polling and uh, I think about two thirds of people uh, really supported the idea of a moratorium on new coal mine approvals as um, Malcolm Turnbull, the former prime minister has backed as well. So I feel like there's a bit of a, a shift in the conversation there that's not really matched in the polit political rhetoric. But Ben, coming back to you, you've been a an advocate for renewable energy and the transition to it for a long time. Um, how does that manifest in your work at, at Telstra at the moment? Yeah, we, um... The, the transition to renewables for us was just, it was a no brainer, um, quite apart from positive climate impact. Um, yeah, the economic race has been won. Um, to Nigel's point earlier, I mean, we are, as a nation, we're endowed with incredible um, you know, natural um, solar and wind resource, um, a land mass of 700 million hectares. Um, and so, you know, for us, you know, investing directly in uh, renewable energy. So we we're, we're, we use a shed load of energy. Is is the kind of the short, <laughs> the short answer, the starting point. Um, we use energy equivalent to about three hundred thousand homes, right, all wrapped up into one bill. So when when Australian families are hurting because you know um, they're struggling to pay the power bill, you know we kind of we understand that. Um, and so our primary, our first port of call on this was actually you know how do we how do we take a position in this energy transition. Um, in a way that serves as a natural hedge, right? And we've done that, you know, for the last few years. We now generate, or we've enabled the generation of um, renewable energy equivalent to about 100,000 homes. And we're looking to quadruple that um, over the next few years. Um, the challenge that we now face um, as an economy, and this is, this is poorly understood, is that we're not, we're not short on energy, right? We have an abundance of energy. I, I, I see that, or we see that the... Um, you know, over the coming years, private investment will fill that gap, right, by virtue of the attractiveness of, of wind and solar. Um, the challenge we've got to solve is um, the flexibility of the market to be able to absorb more renewable energy. Um, and that, you know, we, we kind of often fall into the trap of saying, well, we're losing coal, which is quite a rigid format. It's a very rigid format of energy uh, production. We're losing coal, therefore we need to replace it with a dispatchable or rigid, you know, you know kind of equivalent. 
Um, whereas actually, if you look at things like um, air conditioning load, hot water, uh, pool pumps, et cetera, et cetera, you, ve you very quickly add up a number that kind of fills that gap for you, right? If, if that can become more flexible. And certainly that's what we've been doing inside of our own business. We apply um, machine learning, um, remote connected devices, uh, bat battery storage technology, et cetera, to basically make our load more flexible such that we can absorb more renewables into our into our ecosystem. But we see that as a model for um, the broader market. And I think at the moment, what I would, my, my chief complaint about where um, policy is going is that it's not, it's not going back to use what we've already got, right? So demand is equally a tool to solve the, um, the hole that we're trying to fill in the future. And so, you know, Telstra as an organisation is, is keen to do that on its own account. But what we want to do is try and apply or make those technologies freely available, broadly available, such that um, we can have that impact um, across the energy market as a whole. Mm. Um, yeah, the Australian Institute has done a, a little bit of work on the demand response side of things like you were talking about, and it, it really is an exciting area. Um, Nigel, coming back to you, the race to zero is obviously focused on reaching net zero by 2050. And I feel like a lot of the Australian discourse has really been um, focused on that. But it seems to me that the really important action has to happen sooner than that, kind of in the next decade. Um, and President Biden said as much, he kind of referred to it as a decisive decade for climate action. What do you think the next 10 years looks like? Well, first of all, the race to zero is, is about winning the long term race, but you only do that by running. You know, if you enter a marathon and you're and you're jogging around at 10 minute miles after, you know, after one mile, you've lost. Right. So you've got to be going fast enough from the beginning. So it's not about entering the race and sitting around at the start smoking and talking about how fast you're going to run sometime in the future. It's around setting clear lap times that you've got to hit right so so you're absolutely right the focus is on what do we do now this is the decisive decade if we don't do enough in the next 10 years then we're, then we're into the really dangerous zone of um climate tipping points in the earth system and runaway climate change so the thing the things now that we need to do are massively ramp up the mature technologies ben just talked about renewables we need to get rid of this myth that you need base load um fossil power we don't we don't need that now we know how in fact what you're what you're seeing i was talking to some indian investors yesterday is you know all the renewables are zero marginal cost so everything you build you're going to use every single kilo hour you can get out of it and then you use other things like interconnectors demand response management and more flexible um you know flexibilizing the remaining fossil fuels to make sure you squeeze every zero marginal cost kilo hour out of the renewables um we need to ramp up the um, deployment of electric vehicles. That's, we're just a few years away from that technology because battery costs are coming down 20% a year, being cheaper to buy, cheaper to run, um, more fun because it's great. But if you're a petrol head, you know, drive, drive, get an electric vehicle. You've got instant torque, much more, you know, much more fun to drive than a smelly, noisy petrol car. Um, so those mature technologies, we need to really ramp up. right? And market. the good news is, is that markets are doing that. Um, you know, some support from you know, appropriate policy support in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the a bit of fiscal support until you reach price parity and then markets will finish the job very quickly. Um, you know, think about it. If an electric car is cheaper than a combustion engine car within four or five years, why is anyone going to buy a combustion engine car after that? Range problems solved, um, infrastructure in place. You know, who's going to buy a combustion engine car after that? It defies all economic logic you have to rip up the textbooks if you think that people are still going to buy combustion engine cars what we also need to do is make sure we're investing enough in the next wave of technologies which are going to go to scale in the 30s so green hydrogen um sustainable aviation fuel um you know ammonia fueled shipping um uh, and 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 and, you know, and a lot of changes in protein actually very interesting you know, new forms of protein which don't require intensive farming which are going to be much cheaper and therefore again markets once they reach that tipping point will take off so it's about scaling up what's already mature or nearly mature and accelerating getting down the cost curve. And that's a competitiveness race for countries like Australia. And Australia could win that big in terms of green hydrogen, green ammonia, sustainable aviation fuel, et cetera. Yeah. Um, Richie, I'll come to you in a second on electric vehicles, but um, Ben, you wanted to add something there? So I was a bit desperate there, wasn't I? Sticking my hand up. Um, <laughs> no, Nigel got me excited. Um, I, I think the one of the things that... Um, 
I've been scratching my head about um, over the last few months is seeing um, billions of dollars of road infrastructure projects get announced, right? Road infrastructure policy has the potential to be a weapon for solving um, the, the grid of the future issue, right? So a tiny, tiny investment, right, in, in some of these, you know, inner city or regional um, projects to, to lay down uh, electric vehicle charging infrastructure lays the foundation for uh, what becomes in the future a highly distributed, highly flexible, floating energy storage uh, portfolio, right? And and it's it's one of those things where we've got to we've got to realise that policies are interconnected now, right? You cannot a road policy is an energy policy. A transmission, a, a, a transport emissions policy is actually an electric, electrical grid policy, right? And it's when we say, it's when we make these siloed decisions about what infrastructure do we want to build without thinking about, we, we, we run the risk of squandering these once in a generation opportunities to provide those little catalysts that can accelerate uh, what should become actually a fleet of literally floating batteries, mobile batteries, um, that can address the sort of 6 to 15 gigawatt quote-unquote shortage um, that has been called out by the Energy Security Board. Um, it, it is just, you know, it, it, the, the inability to sort of just inject those small, small investments that create massive, massive option value for us as a nation. Um, so that's, sorry, I, I rambled on there. I just had to... <laughs> no, I had to jump on it. Richie, did you want to add anything to that on electric vehicles? Yeah, you just, so Nigel, it's so refreshing hearing that because here in Australia, we have numerous states that are bringing forward a tax exclusively for electric vehicles, despite them still, you know, puttering along at under 1% of new car sales, um, including some of our biggest states. And it really is just disappointing because it, much like what Ben was saying, it's not seen in, in the larger picture. It's not seen in terms of the interconnected impact it has on other policies. Instead, it's seen as just a cash revenue raising exercise. Um, apparently, will be the income that we're taxing, and so the place. Can I meet Rick? Sorry, out a bit. <laughs> yep, I was, I was just basically just summarizing. Basically, where we are, uh, you are from because you, uh, you've got an interaction there. I'll, I'll come to you if that's right. Ebony, I just wanted to, there's a question in the chat about saying, um, but can an EV tow a van? So I've just posted a link and you can find them. There's about a million videos on the net, electric pickup trucks. You know, if you want a big macho truck that can pull a shitload of stuff along a road or out of a ditch, it's going to be an electric one because of the massive instant torque. So if you if you haven't checked it out, check it out, and then you'll immediately realise that any arguments about thinking that electric vehicles are puny or can't compete in terms of performance are just uninformed. So just check out the video and, and, and a thousand others. I just put the first one in that I googled. We, just yeah. know, we need we need an EV though, Mark uh, uh, Nigel. That looks like a, um, a, a you know an F one hundred and fifty. That's that's the that's the key. Launch, is, it, is it is it is it being launched today or very soon? Right, the F one hundred and fifty is being launched. The electric F one hundred and fifty is being launched. Nigel, to you around developing countries, and obviously a lot of them have said they're going to do more on climate action, but um, specifically relying on kind of technology and financial support. So I just want to ask you to speak to the role that corporations and corporates have in assisting in this goal specifically. Well, I mean, first of all, it's complicated because a lot of emerging economies don't have such stable environments to invest into. So there's, there's, there's a role... For um, for some of the multilateral institutions to, to develop the, 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 the institutional and the, and the, and the financial um, stability. But this is a huge investment opportunity, right? The, the World Bank estimates that we need to invest $4 trillion a year in emerging markets. I was in Kenya recently. I, I actually managed to get out of my Zoom cave here. Um, you know, 
middle income country, um, huge renewable resources um, and, and growing fast. So there are investment opportunities. They might be helped by public sector money, but the majority of the investment is going to come from the private sector. So um, it, it, that's, about, that's about competing for the massive infrastructure build out that's going to take place in the global south um, in the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, um, Ben, I'll come to you next. And I can see we've got about uh, 370 people on the line with us. Thank you so much. Um, I can see we've got a couple of questions coming in as well. We'll come to questions from the audience very shortly. But Ben, obviously, a lot of corporations make a lot of bold claims around climate action. But sometimes I get the sense that a lot of that is greenwash. So how can people assess whether what companies are doing is legit? And how do you kind of hold them to account, do you think? Yeah, so, I mean, I think the starting point is to recognise that, um, uh, you know, the, the public's not stupid um, and shareholders are increasingly getting, you know, getting into uh, quite deep inspection of some of these claims. Um, so anyone who sort of has been greenwashing or, is thinking about green rush washing the you know i think the days are numbered um for that stuff um the if it's the other point i guess is that if it's if it's simply about being able to say well here's my gold star and you know let's go and do an ad campaign um for that then i think it's it's sort of missing the point um yeah we um like i said before like we're, we're our our business is spread all over australia um our physical infrastructure is in uh, parts of the, the continent that are going to be, um, you know, the canaries in the coal mine on um, extreme weather events and that sort of stuff. So we've got a vested interest in solving the problem, not just, um, you know, uh, getting getting credit for, you know, making claims. Um, I think that in particular, though, the days of um, uh, companies providing an, a, a voluntary option, right, that's climate friendly in some way, and having 1% of their customer base purchase that uh, product, often at a premium, and then sticking the, the gold star on their chest, uh, while 99% of their um, operations are still you know, very carbon intensive and not being addressed. I think that's over. That's, that's just over. Um, it's frustrating to see from time to time, but I, I, I think the public is, is far more sophisticated that, you know, than, um, than a lot of these guys would would think, um, uh, but yeah, we also need um, the government sanctioned schemes to sort of you know enforce their brand. Um, yeah, we we in, we've um, certified ourselves through Climate Active, the federal government scheme, um, and in effect, what we do there is we we invest in the in building that as a brand, and so yeah, when we see um, you know splinter schemes that are kind of not you know they're dodgy um actually we need uh those official schemes to enforce their ip um and make sure that these other schemes are you know uh, understood to be what they are which is just you know dodgy um so i think uh, you know i think that battle it's it's um it's certainly been um you know, a feature of the early development of this of this market uh, i think it's getting better um, and certainly the government is, is really reinforcing this idea of transparency. So when someone makes a claim, um, yeah, they're actually saying, look, we want to see the substance of what sits behind that. Um, so I think in, in that respect, I think that's a, that's a good policy direction. Um, and Nigel, I've got one final question for you before we go to uh, questions from the audience. So I wanted to ask about the G7 group of countries which have adopted a firm net zero by 2050 target, but many of whom, uh, I'm not sure if it's all of them, have in in increased their ambition for 2030. How do you think Australia will be received at the G7 as a special guest given we still haven't committed to net zero? Well, I'm, I'm sure, we, you know, with open arms and civilly as a, as a, as a friend and as a... Um, you know, a leading developed economy, but as, as we say, with huge natural resources, which are, are a competitive advantage in the race to zero. And, and I think, you know, with a certain amount of pressure, given that everybody else has made very clear that they're getting to net zero by 2050 and up their targets to be in the region, you know, 
50 to 52 USA 55 um, percent um, Europe 68 percent UK and we know that's what the le leading developed countries need to do to implement the Paris Agreement so I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, polite pressure on the side to, to to join that group and and I think to to move away from the rhetoric that you can have a plan without a target, which of course any business person knows is just silly. You know, you know, a plan is to get somewhere, which is a target. You can't if you have a plan without a target. Actually, you're just you're just loosey goosey. So you know, plan starts with a clear target. You know, again, you enter the race. You're going to try and run a marathon. You know, you know the lap. You know that you know the mile times that you've got to keep clocking out. If you can't if you can't put those up in practice, and if you can't get the first three miles out in time, then you're behind in the race and you may never catch up. So what, one, one thought I'd like to leave people with is, this is not about doing the right thing or the green thing or the ethical thing or the responsible thing. It is all those things, but fundamentally, this is an issue of corporate and national competitiveness. The world is changing. The science demands it, citizens demands it, kids on the street demand it, investors demand it, and as Ben says, they are not stupid, right? So this is about getting into the competitive race. So I think there'll be some you know, there'd be some polite pressure, um, and you know, and I'm and I'm and I'm, and I'm confident that you know, Australia as a responsible member of the family of nations will um, will join up and set some really clear um, targets that are in line with the pace that are needed to be in contention in this race. Yeah, Richie, did you have anything to add to that before we go to the Q and A? Just to add that, whilst at the federal government they haven't locked in a net zero plan uh, at every state and territory, we have a net zero plan. Uh, and when it comes to electricity, it's those states that actually have the conservative, um, liberal and, and national coalition governments that also have highly ambitious electricity, renewable energy zones or renewable energy targets, thinking New South Wales with 12 gigawatts, South Australia with 100% renewables in the next 10 years, Tasmania going to 200% renewable energy. So it is, it's existing at that sub-national level, which is great for the race to zero. And what we just need is to bring that up to the national level and hopefully seeing national peers like the UK, like the US, like Japan, um, will bring Australia back into the fold. Uh, the first question from the audience I've got is from Jock Churchman. Uh, he says, do you think that having a carbon price is the most effective way of ensuring action on climate change? Ben, I might ask you what that looks like in Telstra and why you went that way internally, given we don't have one anymore. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, there's a there's a few sort of related issues here, right? So, you know, for us, a lot of our um, a lot of our carbon footprint comes from um, power or energy, and so um, we've effectively got a, you know, there's part of our um, uh, our price signal internally is is related to you know, energy intensity. Um, Internalising a market-linked um, carbon price absolutely effective, and I see some of the chat is kind of debating that that issue of you know you can't have a plan without a target, you can't have a target without a plan. I would sort of add to that to say um, having a having a market-linked price right is an incredible ingredient to unlock um, creativity, urgency, motivation. Right, and actually, it means that you can have a target without a fully baked plan, because we absolutely there was risk in our target when we went out and we said we're going to be carbon neutral in 2020. We're going to halve our absolutes by 2030, and we're going to be we're going to be 100 renewable, equivalent to our you know uh, uh, carbon intensity of consumption. Um, uh, there was risk in that, of course. We didn't have a full, we didn't have all the details you know mapped out. Um, but the, the ambition needs to be there because if you, if you only commit to do what you know today, right, then that is literally ignoring potential. You're, you're literally just writing off potential and saying, well, I'm only ever going to be as good as I am this year, right? And that's uh, it's kind of pretty piss poor. So, um, so I think that, that combination of target, plan um, and signal, economic signal, you've got to have that. Um, and so for us, it's been very, very powerful. Um, to Nigel's point, uh, we've, I think a lot about this whole concept of you know, carbon price, right? And in effect, we're, we're sort of heading to a place where um, in the absence of um, you know, sovereign um, imposed uh, carbon prices at a domestic level, um, we're ending up with de facto carbon pricing because the global flow of capital 
um, is absolutely being influenced by carbon intensity, right? Both both the sovereign debt and for you know and for and for corporate, um, you know, the flow of consumer dollars is absolutely in, influenced by carbon intensity, um, and we're seeing like you know the the concept of a carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, which is gaining you know, a lot more traction than, than we saw sort of a couple of years ago, um, that doesn't have to be universal to be incredibly effective, right? So you only need a couple of elements of the global trading system to you know, fall into place. And all of a sudden, you've sort of got yourself, in effect, a, um, a de facto um, carbon price. Um, so in some, in some ways, it's like, well, you know, do we really care whether our particular government imposes one because it's coming anyway? Um, and, and you know, for, for a business that is, you know, exposed either because it's a direct exporter or because it's exposed to the risk of import substitution, then, you know, a carbon price is coming for you too. And so actually there's a lot of merit, there's a lot of value in preempting what the world might look like in a few years' time. Um, because if you're trying to react and reconfigure your business, um, when those conditions suddenly, you know, take hold and, you know, you're in the midst of them, um, you've got no lead time. And so, you know, for us, there was actually a, a strategic, I don't want to say defensive sounds a bit negative, but there's a strategic aspect to um, putting this stuff in place so that you're ready for the world of the future because um, it is coming in one way, shape or form. Yeah, Nigel, I might ask you there about the prospect of carbon border adjustment um, uh, coming up as an issue for Australia. It's something that we're hearing, I think, a lot more enter the debate. Um, could you, yeah, kind of uh, reflect on that for us and how much the, the world is moving in a different way? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I really agree with Ben that it's, it's coming ready or not. And so, um, and it might come in an explicit form, you know, the European Union are actually looking at explicit, you know, border adjustment measures. It could come in an implicit form. Um, for example, if you look at steel, you know, when the car companies, I remember when Mercedes a couple of years ago said they'll be net zero by 2039, not just electric vehicles, but the whole vehicle will be net zero. That means the rubber for the tires, the steel for the chassis, the plastic for the dashboard, all got to be net zero. That sends a signal to the whole steel value chain and you see that cranking up. Um, I think also capital markets, you know, with, with Mark Carney, we launched a couple of weeks ago, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for net zero, $70 trillion. I don't know, a trillion dollars is one with 12 zeros. It's just too big to even get your head around. Right? Mm -hmm. $70 trillion of asset owners and, and asset managers and banks committing to net zero. And the day after Moody's, the rating agency, said there's going to be a credit squeeze on companies in heavy emitting sectors who haven't got a plan to get to net, net zero. And, and to Ben's point, um, it's always been the case that innovation is driven by constraint and you don't have to know the last bit of the plan. I always think of this as that's the moonshot back when Kennedy said we're going to land on the moon. No one knew how to do it. That's what drove the innovation, right? So ambitious plans that go beyond what we know to do, as Ben says, other things which engineers love. And if you want to back your engineers and your companies, then set a plan that you don't quite know how to achieve and stand back and be amazed at the innovation that flows. Yeah. Richie, that's not really Australia's approach. No, it's, <laughs> it's a little, it's a little the different. Vaccination rollout or, uh, or uh, energy, but yeah. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. J just right when Nigel, Nigel left off, that, that $70 trillion initiative, Nigel, that's probably the largest initiative of, that, that, you know, the financial um, players have ever come together on, I think, not just on climate, but really ever, which is just an amazing thing to see that kind of interest from the private sector to band together around that and the consequences that are flowing to those that are not. Um, but you know, on the broader point, the federal government in Australia likes to talk about technology, not taxes, but the taxes are coming. They're just coming from the outside, not from within. And the real shame there is that it'll be, you know, taxes that, that are paid uh, and, and the, the, the um, money raised from that will flow to other markets, not to the Australian market to actually invest back here in the kind of future we want to build. So it just doesn't make sense from a nationally competitive point of view if you know that that's where it's going. Um, but on the question of border adjustments, hopefully it will have further consideration at the G7. The Australian Institute is writing a paper on 
border adjustments, which we'll be putting out later this month. And it is something that I think isn't as well understood as it should be, uh, but it should receive further attention because it is coming despite what the federal government might be doing. Uh, the next question is from Christina Sainsbury. She says uh, that she's heard on the radio that China plans to increase their use of coal and that their carbon footprint is larger than everywhere else combined. Nigel, can you comment on the role of China and how active they are in reducing emissions at the moment? I mean, crucial, right? The biggest emitter in the world um, do burn a lot of coal. Um, the questions of whether that's already peaked or not uh, are open to debate. I think crucially, President Xi said um, back end of last year that China will get to net zero by 2060. China is very conservative in its promises, tends to over under promise and over deliver. So I take that to mean that they're, 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 they're aligning their plans with net zero 2050, like the rest of the international community. In fact, Bao Steel, a big steel company, has already said it's going to go net zero 2050. And steel's a big piece. So I think we'll see in the next five years and maybe in the next six months, a real ratcheting up of the plans. We're starting to see Chinese businesses. Um, China, of course, it, it has a lot of coal and burns a lot of coal, but it also has created world leading capabilities in solar, um, in wind, um, uh, in, in batteries and electric vehicles. So to the point about competitiveness, China has used this drive to decarbonize to create world leading industries. And I think that's a, that, that, that's a, that's a lesson for many other countries who've been slower in you know once you get once you lock in leadership then it's very hard for, for, for others to come in so the pivot in china which is committed to peaking this decade and i think that peak date will come forward to be in the next two or three years is going to be crucial if china doesn't peak and then start to reduce quickly the rest of the world can't make up for, for all that so you know many eyes will be on china in the next six months yeah, uh question is for you as um is asking, uh, tell us more the city diversity uh, and perhaps operations participating to zero. Hey, Ebony, looking up there, uh, if you have a question again. Uh, can you hear Is that any? Let me, let me try and answer what I the question I think I heard, which is about how about a bit more about universities and cities participating in the race. Yeah, great. Um, so um, cities and mayors, turns out, are one of the most powerful vectors for change. And we've always known that, right? Cities are places of coming together and, and mashing up of ideas and innovating and vibrancy. They're also places of, you know, the worst air pollution. So there's both, there's both a kind of solution laboratory and a real citizen voter pull if you want to be a re-elected as a mayor in most cities of the world you need to have something positive to say about what you're doing about air pollution but eight million people a year um, die prematurely because of pulmonary diseases caused by the same things that cause climate change burning coal and burning burning oil in cars um, so cities are hugely important i think we, we're now at, um, well over 700 cities committed to net zero, many of them much earlier than 2050. We have 2040, 2030, Glasgow, where we're going to host COP, net zero 2030. So really driving much faster change. And universities, of course, um, I think we've got um, nearly 600 universities now committed to zero. You, you can find out all the links if you just Google race to zero um, and find it. Um, and the great thing about universities is they're producing the leaders of tomorrow. Again, I go back to the moonshot idea. Kennedy announced the commitment to get to the moon in 1961. Um, when the Eagle landed in 1969, two of the key engineers who had to make vital decisions whether to go, no go, when the computer failed, just as the Eagle was descending, were in their early 20s. They had been teenagers when the commitment was made. They'd gone through university and then they were at the leading edge of technology in the whole world. So, um, you know, universities, students today are going to be those engineers and in, in, in implementing those solutions in the next five, 10 15 years. So universities have a hugely important role in it. And, it's, and we see a lot of energy there from young people who've seen the science, understood it, and want to be part of the solution. And that, that's, a, that's affecting businesses, right? If you don't have a good story on what you're doing about climate change as a business, you're not going to attract the best engineers because they don't want to work for a company that isn't on top of this solution. Yeah, Ben, I was going to ask you about that and the, maybe the role of innovation in, in business and how is it... Uh 
appealing for young people and people just kind of getting into corporations. Does that uh, impact to how Telstra does business? Um, I think we, we don't compete for talent with um, Philip Morris. Um, so, and, and, and there's a spectrum to that, right? So, um, yeah, we're not, and the, the race for, for good talent is, is just, it, it's just relentless and it is intense. And um, being able to um, you know, provide a value proposition to, to people, um, you know, talented people um, who will own the future that we're currently involved in, you know, uh, I say designing, but impacting at the very least. Um, you know, the, we, we know that you know, great people want to want to take control of their destiny, not just in terms of the tasks they do at work, but in terms of the impact they have on their communities and and you know the trajectory of of what happens at a at a global level. So, um, you know, giving them freedom to to you know play a role in that is um, that's a massive massive advantage for us, um, which also means that we then got to follow through and invest, you know, back it up with investment and and commitment. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd hate to be in an organisation that's um, dragging its heels because I know you, you'd, you'd get the shit people. Like it's just, just a, you know, it's a, it's a market system. So um, I think that that was another driver that will kind of, you know, people who aren't already kind of on board, um, they're going to find that, that you know their, their intellectual capital or the human capital is just going to thin out over time, and uh, uh, and that'll become another yet another pressure on on businesses who are not. Um, keen to sort of you know carry their weight, so um, yeah, no, it's it's a it's it's very clear to us. Richie, did you want to add anything to that? I'm just still entertained by Ben's comment around attracting good versus shit people. Uh, <laughs> it, it, I mean, you can't put it any clear, clearer than that, really. Like we we have you know a, a, a program here for sort of people straight out of university, the Anne Cantor Fellowship, um, and we're inundated with applications, and we're not for profit. You know, we don't pay anything like the corporate sector or the public sector, but there's no shortage of talent that want to build the future that we all know uh, we need. Uh, and, and that goes for any company or any organization that's actually aligning itself with what those require. And it's great to see that that carries for organizations that are getting on board. Yeah, Richie, I might just follow up. There's a question here from Kimberly Wheeler about the federal government in Australia trying to push carbon capture and storage. Is there anything out of the budget that we can tell Kimberly along those lines? Mm, yeah, coming out of the federal budget on Tuesday night, the government confirmed that it'll be giving about $260 million to carbon capture and storage. The real concern there is that CCS, as it's often known, has, has been a colossal failure. Um, despite over $1.3 billion spent by federal and state governments, we don't have a single successful CCS facility in Australia at a commercial level. There's only one that really operates in the northwest of Western Australia, um, owned by Chevron uh, to bury emissions from a gas field. And that hasn't been operational for three years. And then when they did get it working, it still hasn't gotten up to full scratch. Uh, and so really, you kind of question your head as to why we're still investing in this technology. It's because fossil fuel companies want it. They want it because it gives them the veneer that they can bury their emissions underground and still operate like normal or change the face of their fossil fuels by turning um, by basically uh, using fossil fuels to develop hydrogen and then hopefully tack on CCS as well. So there was another quarter of a billion dollars given to the hydrogen um, industry and development uh, under the budget. And that's also unclear as to whether that's going to go to the dirty form of hydrogen using fossil fuels or green hydrogen using renewables and water. Hopefully it's the latter, but we fear it's the former. So unfortunately, we're just seeing more money for fossil fuels to either change their shape or bury their emissions, whereas there was less than $50 million for renewables and batteries. Mm a bit grim. Uh, I've got a couple of questions here that relate to targets and checkpoints. And I think people have, have really enjoyed that discussion of, you know, how you get there. So uh, there's one here that uh, I heard someone say targets make the difficult doable. Do we need targets? And another person asking, should there be annual checkpoints with annual accounting of progress towards agreed targets? Nigel, how much does targets and those, you know, short-term checking in around lap times, as you've called it. Um, how much are people committed to that globally and how important is it to people's plans, generally speaking? Um, well, just to continue the sporting analogy, you know, there's no athlete 
that doesn't use data to check training progress. Um, and there's no business that doesn't use data to check progress. And there's actually, there's no government at any level that doesn't use data. So, I, I mean, I think it's kind of a non-argument really. I mean, we know we need targets. As Ben says, if you have a long-term target, you might not be able to plan the last steps. I remember a um, good friend, my, um, Hannah Jones, who's just been appointed as CEO of the Earthshot Prize, which is, a, which is a big innovation competition. She was at Nike and she's, when they committed to zero, she said, we know exactly what we're doing to make the first third of reductions. We're confident we have a portfolio of solutions in development that will give us the next third. We're just not sure which ones yet. And we've got no idea of the last third. Um, so I think, um, and then and transparency, you know, because investors and the public are not stupid, as Ben says, is the, is, you know, the sunshine treatment, as we call it, it, it is key, right? So that we, we're, we're all held honest. And again, can't, that, that's just normal for businesses, right? You have to report so your investors know what you're doing. And, and investors are starting to demand the same level of detail on decarbonisation plans and progress as they do on finance. Yeah, Ben, there's another question here that I think might be for you. It says, can we expect to see TCFD Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure mandated for company reporting in Australia anytime soon? And there's a comment there that it's been transformative for Lendlease and informed their carbon targets, including net zero. Yeah, uh, so we, we, we are certainly adopting it. Um, and it's a it's been a useful tool. We're, we're early in that in that process, but um, yeah, it, it is actually a useful framework um, to sit alongside your sort of targets, internalised market link price, and framework for understanding the risks. Because um, so much of of you know, sort of global warming, uh, the difficulty of imparting what does it really mean is because um, the you know, 1.5 degrees of warming or two degrees of warming um, on average, it's an average of averages, right? Now, if I stick my head in the freezer and my, my feet in the oven, you know, on average, I'm kind of comfortable, um, but th th that's not what it's about, right? So uh, you know, our business in particular, you know, we've got um, customers who are in remote communities uh, and, and in find themselves in vulnerable circumstances. We've got assets that are in, um, that exist in you know, extreme physical conditions. And so for us, um, the value of TCFD is about exploring the, you know, the extreme tales, right? So not, not frequent, but, you know, probabilistically, um, how bad can things get um, when, when the average movement results in actually quite an exponential increase um, in the probability of, of bad stuff at the end? Uh, the next question here is from Margaret Kennedy. She says, um, uh, if the better off pop up solar panels and add storage and batteries, who pays for all the community lighting, schools, hospitals, public spaces, etc., uh, and for the increased cost to people like renters who don't necessarily have that kind of control? Richie, I don't know if you want to talk to that kind of um, equity aspect of this transition. Yeah, there certainly is an equity, both both when we just look at um, what, what exists in Australia and then globally as well, as I'm sure Nigel can share in terms of developing countries trying to take their pathways and the help they need too. But in Australia, if you are talking about how we pay for it, well, we can start by actually getting rid of our fossil fuel subsidies which we know because we recently tapped up at the Australian Institute is over $10 billion per year. Um, a good chunk of that is mainly um, for, for fuel um, tax receipts as well. But th there's a number of things that we can do to go ahead and find the money, but also Australia is a rich country. We can afford to do almost anything that we want. And really, if we're committed to going ahead and building a safe climate and bringing everyone with us, then there's ways that you can pay to do that. So those who do need the help can get the help to go ahead and build more energy efficient homes to actually go ahead and access electric vehicles or you know, have transport needs that are clean as well, to get off gas, um, to do a whole variety of things that help us all but then um, can really assist those who can't necessarily pay for it themselves. So we have the money. There's multiple ways that we can do that, uh, especially in getting rid of things that help the fossil fuel industry to help those um, actually address climate. Mm. Nigel, did you want to speak to uh, that idea of equity globally? Well, yeah, I think first of all, a couple, a couple of good examples of, sort of domestic policy where you see shifting, you know, like uh, early days of electric vehicles, it was really only, 
um, the wealthy could afford the very expensive electric vehicles. So, um, you know, fiscal support to EV procurement, you could say, was regressive. But what you see, as the costs are coming down, you can see policymakers now um, tilting support to the lower end of, 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 of the market in order to make it a progressive. So not just to keep funding wealthy people buying their second electric vehicle, but to fund ordinary people buying, shifting from their cheap combustion engine car to their cheap electric vehicle. Another good example would be California, where they've used the revenue from their carbon um, pricing scheme, their emission trading scheme, to both invest in accelerating the transition to renewables and to support areas of fuel poverty, again, to make sure that it's, it's progressive. I think, I think glo globally, this is a huge challenge. Right now, um, we have an issue of that where, where the, 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 the least developed countries in the world are the most affected by COVID. So that I think we'll be looking and it'd be great, you know, to see how the G7 plus four come together around, um, you know, global vaccine diplomacy, um, debt relief, special drawing rights, which are all precursors to then the promise to 100 billion per year, which is which is very small compared to the trillions that are being spent on rebo rebooting the wealthy countries' economies, to to as an act of solidarity really to help. So that's at the heart of the geopolitics of climate change is this injustice that Pacific Islanders and sub-Saharan African states. Um, have done nothing to cause the problem, but the ones suffering the most from it. And so you'll hear a lot about that around Glasgow. Yeah, Ben, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, uh, again, I think this is where um, we 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 tend to think quite small, um, and we we focus domestically. And and we Australia has got this massive opportunity um, to exploit its natural um, resources in renewables. Um, so that we're not we're not serving an Australian energy market, but in fact we become part of a, an Asian um, uh, uh, energy market. And so it's a really specific example, our the consumption the con, uh, energy consumption to land mass in Singapore is two thousand times greater than it is in Australia. All right, that is a that is a massive, massive spread, the likes of which you will never see in a commodity market elsewhere in planet Earth. Right, that underpins um, the project that used to be called Sun. I think it's still called Sun Cable, but the one that's you know massive solar farm out of Northern Territory up to up to Singapore. All right now, that you look at the fundamentals of that. So we're we're using you know extremely, you know, zero um, uh, short run marginal cost energy, completely clean into a market that relies entirely on imported LNG and diesel and other things. Um, now, you know, you repeat that several times over, all of a sudden we're not whinging about whether we should or shouldn't have 50 or 70% renewables in Australia. All of a sudden we're saying, well, what can we do now that we've got 700%? Right. And all of a sudden that question about, oh, what do we do about the six to 15 gigawatts that we, you know, we're losing net net on coal? It's like, who gives a shit? We're 700% renewable and we're exporting. And all of a sudden um, the things that we were once worried about as a threat in terms of um, de facto carbon pricing finding its way to Australia all of a sudden becomes a strength. Right. And so I think, and that's not, that's not a complaint about government. That's just about saying as a nation, wouldn't it be great if we kind of thought of it bigger um, as a nation? Now that's that's you know that's citizens, that's corporations, yeah, it's government. But you know we we've got to get out of this habit also of saying, well, when's the government going to solve the problem? You know, this is a market problem, right? We don't we don't sort of rely on the government to solve um, all of our market problems in other other sectors, right? This is a market problem. So uh, you know taking a bit of kind of you know grabbing a, the the bull by the horns and and thinking bigger, um, given the massive opportunities we've got in what is a you know, fundamentally transformed global market, right? Waking up to that and doing something about it. And I wish I had the idea for Sun Cable. It gives me the shits that it wasn't my idea, but you know, I'm happy to kind of root for them. <laughs> hey, Billy, can I just say, I, I think I've only ever heard the word whinging with an Australian accent followed by the word poms. So it's really, it's kind of fun to hear Ben telling Australians to stop whinging. Um, and I, I really, I'm actually really excited about, you know, Australia's got this huge, you know, it's so lucky with the resources it's got, the natural talent, if you want to, it's got as an athlete in the race to zero. And, you know, and Australian businesses and super funds and cities 
and states are all are all piling in. So I, th I think this is a race that Australia can be really confident about. And I, I kind of expect in a few years that um, far from whinging, there's a, that kind of healthy, sort of cocky Australian swagger um, telling the story about how Australia is winning in the in, in the race to zero because so many you know so many bit parts of the Australian society are are piling in and are realizing that it's an exciting race that they can do really well in. Well, I might leave us on that positive note, I think. So often uh, discussions around climate are depressing, but I feel like that's a, a really nice uh, positive note to end on. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Nigel Topping, Ben Burgess and Richie Merzian for joining us tonight. And thanks everyone for your great questions. As always, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of them, but I, I hope we made it through uh, a few of them. I feel like we touched on a, a lot of good issues there. So thanks very much for your contributions. Please join us over the next few weeks for some more exciting webinars. Next week, we'll be talking to Andrew Giles, the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Ending Loneliness and Holly Walker, who's the deputy director of the Helen Clark Foundation in New Zealand. That'll be on Ending Loneliness. Uh, that's next Wednesday, the 19th of May at 11 a.m. Uh, and do check out our podcast, Follow the Money, and make sure you go onto our website at theaustralianinstitute.org.au for our latest uh, analysis of Budget 2021. There's some great stuff in there. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, stay safe out there, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye. <laughs>